I'm going to start actually with the learning thing because it's quite interesting. It says something about us as an industry. They're all double digit. They're all double digit. That's the only important thing I want you to know. They're all double digit. So the question is, why does every other industry get double digit learning rates? And why does the nuclear industry get zero, one or three percent? That's the question. In the UK, we are as reasonably committed as the government will ever be to building uh, a new generation of light water nuclear reactors, 16 gigawatts over the next 20 years, 12 reactors, so that says the large reactors, the average size of a gigawatt. Uh, parliamentary Select Committee on uh, Energy, uh, the chairman said uh, we need to get on with nuclear reactors, uh, small reactors, but he did, didn't mention the second point was, but of course they've not made the economic case, and that's what I want to talk about today. The other interest I've had is, is looking at seeing the great work that's happening the other side of the pond here, the, the work done the last decade by, by Westinghouse, which seems to have slowed down, and I wonder why. The work that's been done by BMW uh, uh, on Empire, and it seems to have slowed down under why, and of course the great work done by New Scale. And I think the heart of all these is the economic argument, so I want to talk about that today. Economics of volume against the economics of scale. And I'm going to be rather particular about the use of words because people have used today what I would call uh, yesterday, they were talking about scale and I, I thought they were talking about volume and people talk about volume and I thought they were talking about scale. So I'll be very careful about what I'm going to say. But I'm going to cover these points. I'm going to talk about light water reactors, not because I'm against other type of reactors. I think uh, that uh, molten salt and other Gen 4 uh, technologies will have their day. We need to explore them more. We need to leverage the ten, more than 10,000 reactor years of light water reactor technology we have. We understand this technology. We need to understand how to better deploy that. This is a thing that's going to affect the amount of nuclear energy in the world and its effect on climate change in the next 20 or 30 years. I observe the construction cost and scale of conventional reactors, these large reactors we are building, because we don't have anything else, out. they're too big to fund. In the case of the UK, the first project is struggling to get funding. It's gone through all the other things. It's been 10 years in planning. But to find someone will put their hand in the pocket for 24 billion, even with all the government guarantees, 24 billion pounds, that is. That's the first project that an EDF are struggling to do that. They're too slow to construct that although people made promises that these new generation reactors might be built in five or six years, actually the projects from first concrete are taking nine to ten years, uh, and we've got evidence of that around the world. And they're too expensive to make nuclear competitive. They're competitive with other clean sources of energy, but as uh, mentioned earlier, for a significant inroads into the energy space, it has to be competitive at least close to the other sources of energy. People will not pay two or three times the, the current electricity price just because it seems to have a, a, a green tinge to it. They'll pay for a little bit, but they'll not pay two or three times, which is what a lot of the clean technologies are asking for. The conventional view is there's a big hill to climb for SMRs. They have a higher specific cost than large reactors, which impacts their competitiveness. So if large reactors are expensive in terms of uh, unit cost, Small reactors are seen to be uh, harder to do that. But I want to explain the evidence doesn't support that view, and I want to go through the evidence. If you want to look at SMRs, you've got to think about the problems of uh, scale, and you've got to think about the problems of volume, and you've got to think about the, how you design the plant for manufacture, the fundamental issue about how you design the supply chain. And from that, uh, I'm going to co coin the phrase SMMR, double M, small modular manufacturing reactors, to talk particularly about the fact that this manufacturing has to be fundamental to their design, not an add-on. Uh, and they will require the whole supply chain to be uh, affected and components and systems. And I accept that there are other issues other than the capital cost which affect the cost of electricity, and they were talked about uh, yesterday and today. But unless you address the capital cost, which accounts uh, for about traditionally about 70% of the lifetime uh, levelized electricity cost, you don't fix all, uh, anything. So I'm saying let's fix that, and then these other studies uh, uh, will uh, drag in the um, operating cost issues. Oops. So here's the conventional view. 
this is a chart I picked out of an OECD report in the year 2000, which uh, uh, shows that uh, here, if you have the unit cost here, capital cost, if you go up in size, it comes down. It shows a first of the class and it shows the next of the kind for each. It happens to be a chart which is produced by France, and we'll see why that is at the moment. But there were ones done by South Korea, by the US, by the UK, by Germany. All the people, the great and the good, gathered together and produced this report and said this was the state of the arts, and they produced this as data. They said the first of the class uh, has an additional cost of perhaps 20%, uh, and it, it, the scaling index. They said there was a scaling index, that, so as the power went up, the unit cost, the unit capital cost came down, and they said it varies with structures uh, and, and quoted some figures. Um, uh, they said the routes forward were standardization and, and shorter construction timescales, not something we disagree with. But they uh, said and established in people's mind the idea that there was a power scaling law, and this meant that SMRs have a very high um, hill to climb. This idea was repeated and is repeated in a lot of the work done by Westinghouse the last decade. It's repeated in all the studies produced for SMRs for OECD in 2010 and 2012. The idea that this scaling thing is a fundamental issue uh, uh, and uh, provides a large uh, thing. And so the, the, the idea is if you have a large reactor and it costs to pay $5,000 a kilowatt electrical installed to build, because of the scaling effect, if you build a 100 megawatt reactor rather than a 1,000 megawatt reactor electrical, it might be $10,000 uh, per, per kilowatt electrical. And to, you, to go the other way, the tools you have, and this is uh, information, this is a uh, thing from Westinghouse, uh, the tools you have are these design simplification, multiple units, production learning, standardization, short builds, uh, and financial savings. A very good set of things to do, but just look at the range. You've got to go down from about 10,000 to below here. It is a huge hill to climb. And when people say the economic case for SMRs is not made, this is what they're talking about. They're saying, we understand, we don't like the large reactor costs, but we understand it. You built them. There's some evidence of that. If you're going to be two or three times above that, and then you've got all these things that are going to nibble away at it, we're not convinced. However, I'm going to have a look at the actual data that's behind this chart. I'm going to throw perhaps a bit of doubt in that. And as a result of that, I'm going to throw a bit of doubt at this chart as here. First of all, I'm talking about specific costs. It's the, the, the cost divided by power. And when they talk about power scaling, they say the, the, the unit cost, the unit capital cost is a, a function of the power uh, to this value A. And A is if there's a is, uh, equal to zero, there's, there's uh, no scaling effect. If it's uh, less than zero, there is a scaling effect. So the idea is the unit cost is coming down with, uh, as the power goes up. This is a conventional view. And it's interesting, at a component level, it's well established, and it comes from lots of other areas of construction. And you will ask me later why, if I throw doubt on it, it doesn't apply in nuclear. Uh, that the, the, the answer, if you read all the references, are this magic figure, if you aggregate across the plant, is between minus 0.5 and minus 0.35. If it's minus 0.5, it says the unit cost comes down with the square root of the power. The second idea I'm going to uh, talk about is the learning by volume. This is a conventional view from manufacturing, that, uh, and it started uh, in the aerospace industry, which I worked in quite a lot. And uh, it, it's called the right learning curve, a like progress curve. It says the man time cost falls by a, a figure, by percent, as the volume d doubles. And the right law was done in the 1930s for, I think, building bombers in wright Patterson Air Force Base. And they said, if you build 10 bombers and you build another 10 after that, they cost you about 80% of the first 10. So this idea of progress and learning is a widely understood affair, and now is franchised and used by other industries. And we'll look at some data about that. Um, people tend not to talk about the, the, the uh, uh, the right progress figure, they take, take one away from it, and they talk about the learning rate. So if a right figure of 80% is the same as 20% of learning, just the obverse. <clears throat> one thing to say, if uh, right up front, nuclear industry is somewhere between 3 and 5%. If you're lucky, very often it's down at 1%. Um, you, you can roll these two together. Then the specific cost is a function of power to the A and the... Uh, the volume to another index, and that index is to do with the number of uh, doublings. 
I'm going to start actually with the learning thing because it's quite interesting. It says something about us as an industry. I'm a lifer in the industry, so it says something about us. Here's uh, some uh, su summary information produced. There's two different reports, one done by Chen and Goldberg, another one done by McDonald and Stratz and Holter. Uh, one, they're slightly different. One looks just at the man time element, and then one looks at everything you can do to get the cost down. But it looks at these figures and comes up uh, uh, with uh, information for aircraft, shipbuilding, semiconductors, uh, photovoltaics, and wind turbines. And then this one does some other power generation things. I'm not going to go through in detail, just the numbers. Just look at it. They're all done double digit. They're all double digit. That's the only important thing I want you to know. They're all double digit. So the question is, why does every other industry get double digit learning rates and why does the nuclear industry get zero, one or three percent? That's the question. So the scaling effect. This is the chart I showed before from France, which was supposed to be data. This is the actual data from France. You know in France they built 58 reactors, started with a Westinghouse license. They took it in 74. The first reactor went critical, I think, in 77, so it must have started a bit before that. And they'd built the first 30 900 megawatt reactors within 10 years of taking the license. And these are the ones here in blue. And then they said, well, we need to get some economies of scale to get the cost down, so we'll make a bigger one. And they made uh, these um, 1,200, 1,300 megawatt reactors here. And then they said, we make a slightly bigger one, and specifically the case for, for the N4 reactors where they would get the unit cost down uh, by, by building bigger ones. Now, this data is data published in 2012 by the, the, the fr French finance ministry called a corps de comp. It's not stuff which was synthesized by a, a chap called Arnoff Grubler uh, incorrectly uh, earlier. So what one, sees, what one sees here is this, you'd expect as the power comes uh, up, the unit cost comes down. This is specific cost in euros per kilowatt hours in the same units, 2010 euros. In fact, it goes up. I mean, it's got a, quite a big spread. But it doesn't come down, that's the point, is it doesn't come down. We can talk about the why, what's the reason for the spread in the different groups uh, if we had more time. But the issue is it doesn't come down. And it was, they specifically went for larger reactors because they felt that they were going to get improvements in cost. And it's not because of uh, volume. They built 20 of these reactors. Uh, and so it's not as if they didn't build enough of them. What you do, if you look at the data uh, in France, you see that within these groups, uh, there is some learning. Uh, there is some learning. Uh, there's no scaling effect, but there is some learning if you stay on the same site. Generally, they built reactors four, four to a site. On some sites, they built six. The first reactor cost, might cost X. The first pair of reactors cost X. The second pair cost about 10 to 15% less than X. And when they went down the road, the first reactor on the first pair of reactors on those six cost X again, and the second pair cost um, about 15% less. So there's, there's learning on, on, on sites, but not learning between sites. And that's a very important issue. This is the best data in the world. These are the people who have built the most similar reactors and the most often and in the shortest time frame and are the most close control, both of EDF, who are very disciplined in the control of the design, and Westinghouse, who are controlling effectively the license through that. So there's no evidence here of a scaling effect. Drawing together a larger set of studies, <clears throat> I said that if you read the books that people say that the official answer to this a scaling effect is minus 0.35, minus 0.5, whatever it is. Uh, but it's based on some fallacious data, which has been now drawn out. First of all, it's based on data which was quite early in the program. There's two studies, one in 1978 that people always quote, and another one in 1982. They only, they're mainly U.S. data, and they quote for about the first third of the U.S. program. That I'm showing here for the U.S. Uh, thing done by Cantor and Hewitt and replaced by the University of Chicago for 67 of the 100 and so reactors in the U.S. This is much more authoritative. Uh, uh, there's the 58 reactors from France, there's Japan, Magnox, Korea. There's about um, half the total reactors in the world in this survey. There's none for Russia. They don't publish any data. There's none from China. And oddly enough, there's none from Germ Germany, which is a quite a large program. You might have expected to see some there. But uh, these are the published data that I found. And if you analyze them or take the analysis that people have done in the same way, the index A here is specific power. Remember, we're looking for a negative number. 
the only negative number it happens to be the UK, it's a small number, it doesn't really make a difference. So there's no evidence of scaling in any of these programs in any of these countries. And the learning uh, uh, effects are, as I said, quite small. 3%, 5% as the best estimate. In some cases, zero. In fact, if you look beneath this data in more detail, the best evidence of learning is probably in South Korea, who've been building 1,000 megawatt reactor every year for the last 10 years, since 2000. And they are consistently getting 5%. And that's really the strength of their offering now. They are probably the best in the world at building PWRs, which were largely built, designed in the US. They were System 80, and they've adapted them and improved them. But it's, it's the consistent approach to uh, uh, con site construction that, that uh, has worked. Because this said to me, if this is true, what's different about the nuclear industry? And then how does this apply to small reactors? Why are these values low? First of all, we know that the constant evolution of reactor design. And that's been not, not no. The US is the best or the worst example of that. 100 reactors, almost none of them are the same, and five or six vendors. But the nature of the financing uh, uh, and the authorities in the local states meant that these things went off in different directions. They had different architect engineers, had different supply chains, a lot of local de detail design, and lots of uh, incremental changes, some of them forced on mainly by the, the many actions from Three Mile Island. Uh, increases in scale, which tested the limits of knowledge. So as people get larger, it, when it's on the designing board, people say, oh, well, I'll just make the reactor a bit taller or I'll make this pump larger or something. And you can make a theoretical ar argument for um, economies of scale, but you, you come up against the limits of technology. All through the uh, history of the nuclear industry, we've been testing the limits of technology and scale. And the example I give is, um, it happens to be a French one, but it's not because I'm against uh, the French. The, the, the EPR reactor is a 1750 uh, single shaft uh, uh, steam, uh, wet steam turbine. It's the biggest one in the world. At Hinkley, when we build it, we'll have the fifth one in the world. <laughs> so that's great, we haven't got the first one, but we'll have the fifth one, uh, and then, then the, the sixth one. There's not been much learning. This tests the state of the, the, the technology, not just in the nuclear areas, but in, uh, right across the plant. The, the, the way you make the shafts, the way you make the, the turbine blades, the way you make the casings, how you assemble them, the, the tolerances, you're testing the state of technology each time, and this gets in the way of learning. The, sec uh, the last point is about the construction sites. Um, Hinkley Point, they say there'll be five or 6,000 pa uh, people on site every day. They'll come down the one slip road, they'll go through security and through the contractor's offices, they'll go into the huts and get the information in the toolboxes, they'll go across this huge site and they'll do their job and come back. They'll do an amazing job and they will build Hinkley and you know, we'll really uh, admire them for it. We'll admire them for doing a job we've made really extremely difficult. And the guys in the UK, have not built, because we haven't built a reactor for 25 years, the guys who are doing it will have never been on a nuclear construction site before. We'll train them and all that, but it's, it gets in the way. So I say here, complex uh, construction sites inhibit coordination, communication, and learning. Um, the, very often we move from site to site, we, get, we say we don't like these contractors, let's get some more. Or the project's got on so long, let's get a new team because those guys are, are knackered. But the learning goes out, out and particularly with a, uh, it happens in the UK, I think it happens in the States, that, that unless you've got some force for integrating and passing that knowledge on and maintaining consistency, uh, that, uh, that you have problem. The detailed design is repeated by each site-based team, and I think the evidence from France shows that EDF provided very strong control of the basic design, but they let all the site people build, do their own detailed design. And that's the practice, I think, right across the world. People do the local detailed design, so the, t the, the things are different uh, and uh, inhibits learning. The nuclear is the closest to the aerospace industry. We're trying to build things which have the same sort of quality standards as aerospace, and we're putting them on sites in the rain at a distance with people who have not done it before. Uh, again, using some figures from Hinckley, um, they say that there's enough steel in the rebar to go to Rome and back from where Hinckley is, which is uh, a few thousand miles. And this is, this rebar is bent into a, knitted into a stage, which is close as, you know, the sweater you wear. And then it's done to a precision a, a tolerance that's, re, that, you know, that's, that's almost aerospace in, in, in style. And so instead of 
um, reinforcing being something that's just, you know, plus or minus half an inch. This is precision stuff, and we're asking guys to do this precision stuff in huge volumes on site in a way which is perhaps unrealistic. Um, the final point, long periods between projects uh, and long periods between the task, this is what I would call the, the ideal conditions for forgetting rather than learning. If you're in manufacturing, you're doing the same task every week or month or day, depending on the, 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 time, the time step of the factory. These you don't, you have different people in different places to different standards. This is a conditions for forgetting, not for learning. So what evidence do we have about SMR? So uh, someone pointed out to me a, a very good study done by Abdullah at uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, where people are looking at the, how much progress has been made at getting control of the costs of, as it turns out, the new scale and the, the Westinghouse uh, reactors. They asked 23 ec industry experts to do point estimates and bounded estimates of these two designs. And for comparison, they did a 1,000 megawatt reactor, which I presume was the AP1. And, and so they, 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 they produce these, this data, which I, I've copied here, and I've done a bit of reanalysis. So it's interesting, the 1,000 megawatt reactor, there's quite a lot of distribution of what people think uh, of something that's completely well known about the, the uh, design. of Here's the 45 megawatt, a lot of spread. This is 5, 45 megawatts. This is 24, meg, uh, 45 megawatts. And what you can do is you can reanalyze this data and say, there's a spread, but you can say, what, is, what does this tell us about learning, and what does it tell us about scaling? Because you've got, you've got volume in both cases, and you've got the, 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 the reference point of 1,000 megawatts to 225 and 1,000 megawatts to 45. And what you find is uh, the mean data shows a low scaling index, uh, point, minus 0.2 or minus 0.1, uh, quite a spread on it, but the average is a, a, a scaling index. So the guys have done a very good job with their integrated designs to get a lot of cost out of the reactor. So that's what that says. They uh, show, uh, again, a wide range of, of learning, but there's some positive learning uh, in this data. Um, this is analysis, so it's not, not actual data, but it's the best, best we've got. So I thought, well, let's go and see and use this type of approach and say, what are the parameters we have to have to make a success of SMRs? And then what would we have to do in concrete terms to bring this into effect? It seems that the designs that are being done have got, have got a grip on the scaling effect. Uh, it's not this 0.5 or 0.35. It's a small scaling effect. Uh, uh, what can you do? So, Here's a parametric type of model which says if you take a large reactor, 1,000 megawatt, and you have the sort of industry standard learning rates, if you have a small reactor, it initially starts off on higher, higher cost, but because it's improved learning because you put it in factories, can you get the cost from small reactors to build below large reactors? And, and this shows the result. Here's a 200 megawatt and it's 100 megawatt. And it's just a parametric. This is the scaling factor. This is the learning factor. And you see these red 500s. That says you need more than 500 of these reactors for it to be better to build small reactors. That is, it's infeasible. However, so there's a region of feasibility down here for a 200 megawatt design, and there's a smaller region of feasibility for a 100 megawatt design. Uh, uh, and so I'm saying there's some region of feasibility here with point twos and learning rates like that. So if I perhaps look at some more specific cases, here's your uh, scaling factor, here's your learning factor, and the, the current uh, practices, 0.35 is the scaling effect, and overall learning 3% that it's not e economically feasible for SMRs. So if SMRs are not going to uh, do better than this, they're never going to be economically competitive against large reactors, never mind anything else. If you first of all, uh, in, because of the design work that's been done, convince yourself the scaling effect is much larger, but the learning effect, the way you organize the supply chain, the way you build it's not fundamentally different, that you a ditto, you, 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 it's more than 100 gigawatts of, of power before you could um, um, uh, make SMRs competitive. You need both a low scaling effect and a reasonable uh, uh, learning uh, um, and this quite quickly brings the amount of power that you require to uh, affect into play. Um, uh, so here shown um, 
uh, 15 gigawatts for 100 megawatts and 2.8 for the 200 megawatts. So a few, gig, a few gigawatts or a few tens of gigawatts, uh, which means, um, you know, uh, some tens of reactors. But those tens of reactors, it has some uh, implications for those tens of reactors. Now, I use this as, again, it's a rather simple model. Um, and I'm showing a picture here of the uh, Chinese ACP 100, not because I'm making a point about this. Th this is very similar to the Empire and uh, I think the Westinghouse designs. What we have here, and I wanted to point this out, is we have, this is what comes to me. We have the reactor, here's the reactor here, right in the middle. And there's a containment with a crane in it and all that, and a containment building around here with other stuff. And what this says to me is, the nuclear engineers, and I'm a nuclear engineer, they've done a real good job on designing the reactor and the fuel and to go in a factory and to be shipped to site, but then they put it in a conventional building. Now, what happens if you do that? If you look at the cost spectrum of a typical reactor, about the reactor vessel, reactor vessels, fuel and vessels, about 30% of the capital cost, structures and shielding, control systems, m and &E services, and power conversion. If you look crudely about putting these things in a factory, you can get absolutely 10% uh, aggregate uh, uh, learning rates. So you put the reactor vessel in there, you get your 10%. And the power conversion, you should be able to get a high number, but the problem is it depends whether you have used the same suppliers again and again, and you get them integrating your supply chain so you can do that. But the normal approach is to say, We'll go out and we'll have just the local supplier, and it doesn't matter whether it's Alstom or G or Siemens or whatever, they can just supply the conventional plant. But if you do that, there's no learning, or the learning between projects is, is much blunter. That uh, structure and shielding, uh, it's, it looks like conventional design. I can't see that it's going to be any, anything uh, different from what we get today. The control systems, there's a lot of potential for that, but the way in which people do control systems is that they uh, leave the technology that's late, they tend to customize it for each plant, and even within similar reactors, you find that, that people uh, um, uh, ha have what look functionally the same control systems, but behind the scenes in the boxes, they're actually rather different. Now, if you work these out, you, you work out the share of the cost times the learning rate, you can only get about 4% learning rates from that. And so, even if you do the best possible thing in terms of the reactor design and put that whole reactor into, into a factory and you put the most modern techniques about that, you can't get to a feasible re region for SMR uh, competitiveness using that. So here's my SMMR, Design X. Design the whole plant for manufacturing, not just the reactor vessel. You have an integrated supply chain, so you use the same suppliers, the same place, wherever you go, and you go for factory quality and production program, you can uh, uh, get um, more design for manufacture across the plant, and you can get about 8%. So to summarize, SMR is based on light water technology, are being considered because they are, have got some advantages in costs and scale over conventional reactors, but the, the idea that they will have much higher spot, specific costs than re, react, large reactors, I think, is wrong. The, the, the current way we build all our reactors, every country in the world, encourages forgetting rather than learning, and this is a fundamental problem about the economics of nuclear power. If we design these reactors, the whole reactor, the containment, the controls, the m and &E services, uh, and, and the, the conventional plant, we can get uh, them be competitive with large reactors for relatively small amounts of, uh, of, of volume. But its viability depends on design simplification and common safety cases, and we talked about that yesterday. Depends on developing a global supply chain optimized for productivity, not lots of local variants, and, and addressing the local, the large investment cost and scale issues. The French experience is actually three separate designs, small, medium, and large. Maybe if you looked at uh, 
It, would it, would, the, the, would uh, the learning be right. more apparent if you did it in those three pieces? The French evidence, they took a license initially for a three-loop 900 megawatt design. They extended that to, to, to upgrade it, so it was then a 1300 megawatt three-loop design. Then they designed their own four-loop design, but based on very much the same technology. Uh, and so they, 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 they are uh, separate things. But the, the 900s and the 1300s or 1250s, depending on you look at, are very similar reactors. They just were, they were upgrades on the same. Within the groups, they were very disciplined about keeping them together. But within the 900 group, because of, I think, pressure of Three Mile Island and pressure to make things in France, there are three tranches within that which you can look at. But this is the best data for common designs. They're much more common than the designs which came out of the vendors in the US. They're much less cost customization. These are much more consistent. As a result, they're actually relatively cheap uh, by current standards reactors to build. Thank you, and uh, very interesting.